You have three after now. Yeah. Okay. Well, then I guess we need to get started. Yeah, three after. <laughs> um, yeah, because the faster I talk, the, uh, the faster we can all um, go to other facilities. Um, so, hi, I'm Carl Swank. And I'm Andrew Chiapese. And uh, we have not rehearsed this. At all. <laughs> <laughs> so, so bear with us. Um, I, uh, I am a, a, a Pittsburgher for life, but now living in, uh, now living in Nashville, Tennessee, so I guess I should say howdy y'all. Um, came home for pod camp because it's one of the best things on the East Coast, to be perfectly frank, and um, some of the th best people that I've ever met that, um, that know things about social media are, are at this conference, and so this was, a, this was a not miss for me. I missed it last year, watched the whole thing online, um, and so now I'm happy that I'm here this year, um, back, back in the... New digs, but but getting to, to know the familiarity of, of this new area, and I like it a lot. So um, we're both running on a little bit of very little sleep. Um, it is football season, if you hadn't figured that out. Um, so we were both um, up until oh, I was up until two thirty. You were up. I was up. I was up until three o'clock. Um, and I am a pod camp dude, so please be gentle. <laughs> uh, but I uh, I grew up in Erie and have been here in Pittsburgh since moving down to college um, seven years ago. So um, very familiar with everything. And what we want to do today is just sort of talk about what we do as members of Rivals.com. If you're not familiar with Rivals, um, Rivals is part of the Yahoo Sports, and Rivals covers college sports and high school sports. And there are multiple team sites and multiple high school sites. And as you can see, this is the main page of Rivals.com. Uh, it's what you would go see if you were to just click on college sports if you were to visit Yahoo. Um, and Carla can talk a little bit about what she does in terms of being one of the network producers, and then I can talk a little bit about what I do as far as a little bit further down as one of the specific site publishers. So, uh, let me switch over the PowerPoint for a second. Um, see, like I said, we haven't rehearsed. Um, yeah, what Andrew is um, the publisher of one of our high school sites, PSI. Um, a lot of people associate rivals with college, primarily college football and, and those sorts of things. Um, but little, little known to a lot of people is that we do actually be on a high school network as well. Um, and so Andrew is one of our publishers on the, on the high school network. He also um, runs an independent site um, for RMU that he founded back when he was still an undergrad um, called Colonial, colonialscorner.com, um, which has been very successful. Um, and he's done a really good job with, with keeping that running and, and those and uh, gaining a following for that. Um, I'll let you talk about that a little bit later. Um, my, my position, I actually, this is how, how the world works. I actually started as the producer, or, or the, or the uh, publisher of PA Crafts. Um, I have held that job for about a year, um, and then actually got promoted down to, the, to our national office down in Nashville, where I now oversee all of the high school sites. Um, so I have 39 high school sites that um, I have to keep happy on a daily basis. Um, and that can range from everything from editing stories to promoting stories for national, um, to national pages, uh, to handling advertising needs, um, all those sorts of things. You never really know for sure on any given day um, what I'm going to be getting into. Uh, so it's, it's kind of an interesting world to be working in. Um, I also serve as the assistant editor for Rivals High, which was the site that I had up there um, just a second ago. I wish there was an easier way to do this. Um, but this is, we well, joking, this, this is our baby. Um, so it looks just exactly like the Rivals.com site, except for the fact that all of this information is high school. Um, and as you can see, we've actually updated this. That's, that's, that's all stuff from last night, actually, um, that we have posted up there right now. And essentially, I tell everybody every single word that's on Rivals.com, I have read. Um, it comes across my desk. So that's why I was able to do this morning. Um, yeah, she's not bailing out us as site publishers. She is reading everything and making sure that everything sounds coherent and make sure that uh, everything is up to the standards of Yahoo Sports. Because we are very much a partnership, and that's one of the things that we're going to talk about is how we all sort of work together as an entire giant network. And you can see we have a lot of people to meet within the network. Yeah. Can I ask just a real question? Sure. Does everything get a second review before it publishes? Um, on the high school side, for RivalsHigh.com, yes. Yes, we do get that. Um, for Rivals.com, the national pages, they get at least two reads, if not three, depending on um, how quickly the deadline is, how quickly they need us to turn stuff. Um, that's a different department altogether. All I occasionally, during bowl season or during busy season, 
I oftentimes will get a, a message saying, hey, can you give this a read real quick? We're, we're drowning. Um, and th that's usually, if high school stuff's kind of calmed down, then I'll gladly give stuff a second read. But um, but yeah, th for the team sites, they all handle things differently. Yeah. They're, um, the team sites, well, let me do the national sites first. We have four national sites. Um, it all looks like the same thing, but they're actually four separate sites. We have college football, and then there's a separate site for football recruiting, which is what Rivals.com is pretty much known for. That was how we made our put our name on the map um, with our star rating, ratings of, of prospects. Um, we do the same thing for basketball. So we have a basketball site and a basketball recruiting site. It does the same exact thing. Um, then we have individual team college sites, and there are 120 of those across the country. We have a, a team site for every single one of all the uh, big six conference schools, so those are all your, your BCS conferences. Yeah, if, um, you, if you're a fan of Pitt, then you're probably aware of Panther Lair. Panther Lair but, if you're a fan of Penn State, then you might be a fan of BWI Illustrated uh, or Blue White Illustrated. Yeah, BuckeyeGrove.com Buckeye for, the, for the Ohio Staters in here. Um, but yeah, every major Big Ten, Big East, um, whatever these conferences are going to be called now, um, they all they all have individual team sites run by independent contractors who live in the vicinity of where those schools are located, so they're on the ground working at all those schools. Um, and then, like I said, the high school sites, we have 39 active sites right now um, on the high school network, so we have 39 of the 50 states covered. Um, and that's just strictly high school. It's Everybody does their, their high school site a little differently. Some focus just on football, some do a little bit of everything. Um, it's, it's kind of a unique mixed bag of information. One of the things that we've learned as publishers is that college sites can sort of follow a pretty set formula, but high school sites, such as myself, we have to find what works, and that's where this sort of power of the network comes involved in, and is trying to find ways to be unique, because what works for PA Preps and what works for covering Pennsylvania high school sports may not work in New Mexico or Minnesota, but at the same time, there are ways that we can find ways to be uh, a unified force, and that's worked with some of the things that we've done with social media and with just our online presence in general. So we, we had a conference, um, we had a publisher conference in, in Las Vegas in June, um, where a good deal of the publishers, both high school and college, flew out to Las Vegas, and we had about uh, 36 hours of intensive meetings, yep. um, talking ideas back and forth, getting everybody in the same room to, for you know once a year to do that. And um, this was kind of the, the overall theme, and this is totally corporate speak. You'll get that. Um, Power of the Network is leveraging entities under one umbrella to create a unified online presence, which really boils down to if we all work together, we can do remarkable things. Um, because you know who really needs all that corporate speak anyway and that was just the one message that we drove home is we have four four national sites 120 college sites 39 high school sites how do we take all of that information and pull it together under one unit because if you do that what we have is something pretty incredible um, because we have people on the ground in all these different areas um, and what we've done is we managed to take this this thesis statement if you will um, and spread out between the way we cover things online, because we are an online media entity, as well as what we do in social media. Um, more corporate speak, I, I apologize. Um, strong vertical integration, that's one of the first keys to making this work. Um, and there are some pretty obvious examples of this. That what's interesting about the way that we operate is, is that um, there are, stories can move both directions. We have a very strong vertical integration. So the two big examples, um, I don't know if you might have heard about this little story um, on Miami Hurricanes that came out um, last month. Um, Yahoo Sports, that was us. Um, I did not know, everybody asked me this question, so I'll go ahead and say it. Did you know that the story was coming? No, I didn't. I knew that something was coming. We had been told that something was coming at 5 o'clock. Um, as the day trickled on, we found out that it involved Miami. That's all I knew. Um, so I had no idea, but I was told to be ready. <laughs> and uh, when it landed, everybody, you know, we had the same reaction that all of America did. Um, holy fill in the blank. Um, and as that kind of, in, you know, we got the first story, and then all those sidebars started to come out. Um, what is sure, if you haven't seen it, um, there's now, we now have an investigative reporting page on Yahoo Sports um, that has all of this information on there. It was one story one column, another follow-up, and 78 sidebars. There was a sidebar for every single person that was involved and how they were involved in this Miami investigation. The sheer volume of work is remarkable. Um, and that came out over a period of about five hours, I think. It started coming out, and then finally by about 10 o'clock central, um, we finally had all the sidebars out. I was I was, on, I was off doing something at the time, and you know, I started 
I'm checking up on Twitter and, and, and seeing what the various, you know, latest breaking news is, and I see this come across from, you know, the Yahoo Sports Investigative Unit. You know, I, I'm a fan of college football. I, I'm watching. I, I know all about the latest scandals. I, you know, the Ohio State issue had just come up. Um, there have been issues in Oregon with, you know, paying services and all these different recruiting violations, and then suddenly Yahoo Sports dropped this bombshell with this in-depth reporting, and this is a case of where we had not just what was done with Yahoo Sports, but suddenly the Miami rival site had a lot of work to do, all the high school sites that had uh, players that were from the state. You know, I had two players from Pennsylvania that were tied up in this large investigation and suddenly we had a way of taking this and furthering it along and not just having it on Yahoo Sports. Right. What ended up happening was when that story landed, um, obviously the, the tweet the, the tweet came from above. Um, and we all knew that that, that was coming. We, you know, they, we watched it, we saw it, we retweeted it, started talking to the publishers. By the time it was all said and done, um, you know, there were, there were like 78 or so official stories with the Miami investigation. There were probably more than 200 pieces of content um, created around the Rivals Network just based off of that one story. So you took one story nationally and it just kind of spread all the way out because every site had an angle that they could take. Um, you know, it was, even though it was just about the University of Miami, every high school site had an angle. Um, every, a lot of, uh, you know, all, all the ACC schools had angles to take on it. Um, you know, we had, um, we got our Miami site publisher involved. Um, he did some radio interviews about his aspect on it. He wrote some follow-ups. So it was just kind of a snowball effect for about the better part of four days um, where, you know, one story led to a whole bunch of content. Yeah, because this is all about furthering the discussion. We're an online media entity. And in the modern world, there is no such thing as a 24-hour news cycle where one story, whether it's political, whether it's environmental, whether it's international, national, sports, entertainment, one story typically does not dominate now for 24 hours like it used to when you would get your morning paper and watch your morning news show, and that would be the story. The main headline would be the major story for 24 hours until the news cycle began again and you had your new front page headlines. Now, it's the era of immediacy. And we as publishers and as a network have to continue to further the discussion because otherwise we're going to be left behind. And we don't have a solid piece of media product to sell to people. We, we don't have a newspaper. We don't have a magazine, although some sites do put out regular preview magazines. We have your eyeballs for however long you choose to stay on the page and whether or not we can convince you to come back. So that's sort of the method that we've sort of taken as site publishers. When Yahoo Sports does something, or even just Rivals.com in general, or the main site does something, if there is any way that we can latch onto that and grab it, then we're going to and try and make it something that's unique to us. I mean, again, I had two high school, I had two former Pennsylvania high school players who were involved in this Miami scandal. I didn't do much. All I did was check to see what the reaction was from their local newspapers. One of them was here in Pittsburgh. Um, no one had been able to get in contact with one of the players. Um, Pittsburgh Tribune Review did. I grabbed that, rode around it, did some additional work, did some more legwork from, I think it was out in Reading, um, and made it a unique content item that worked for my site for 12 hours or so until we were able to move on to some other stories. So. Uh, it's one of the ways that, from the top down, we can grab on main stories and try and grab a little bit piece of the pie from major national news. But it also works the other way. It works the other way also. And the Big 12 Missile Crisis, um, this was actually something I, I found out about this at the publisher convention. I didn't realize that's what they, they jokingly referred to it as. Um, this, was, this was last year, um, not this year, although you could call this year, they, they called it Big 12 Missile Crisis Part 2 this year. Um, with A&M, but last year it was Texas. Um, and we were fortunate enough on the network to have one of the top writers in the nation in Chip Brown, um, who works for orangebloods.com, which I'm sure if you were following the Texas situation last year, you heard orangebloods.com mentioned time and time and time again. Um, that's a, that's a rivals.com site. Um, and it's one of our best in, in the network. And Chip Brown had a story and, uh, it started out as just a team site story, but then 
it, we kind of realized that, wait, there's a little bit more to this. And the fact that Chip Brown has a very solid reputation as, as a good reporter, um, he's been published in numerous, numerous, uh, best, he was in the Best American Sports writing a couple years ago. Yeah. Um, I think it was 2008. Yeah, eight or, eight or nine. Um, so, we, so we managed to, to take his story and push it up the ladder and, you know, forward it to our editors, who forwarded it to their editors, who forwarded it to their editors. And within about 12 or 14 hours, this story was on the front page of Yahoo, not the front page of Rivals, not the front page of, you know, just orangewoods.com. It went all the way to the front page of Yahoo, and all of a sudden, Chip Brown is making appearances on ESPN. Um, and that's how, I mean, that's how quickly it happened. Just a little site story went all the way up to the top, and every single site publisher has that opportunity. If they get a story, and, you know, we know the sourcing, and it's a legitimate story, um, you know, stories get elevated. We elevate stories on a daily basis. You know, there are usually at least two or three publisher stories on the front page of Yahoo Week, at least. Um, and that's one of the things that, that I'm responsible for, actually, is I, I go through the high school network and, and promote stories for elevation. Um, so, that's, so that's the unique advantage. We can have stories go from the top and go all the way down. We can have stories from the bottom and go all the way up to the top. Um, but that's only one aspect of how the integration works because you can't you can't just go up and down the ladder. You also have to work horizontally. And Andrew actually has a, a really great example of this that just kind of happened on the amazing what the Tower of Twitter and um, some meeting some connections at, at the publisher convention can do. How many of you? A stupid question in Pittsburgh. How many of you are Steelers fans? <laughs> Pretty much everyone, right? Except the crappy. Along with working with rivals and running my own site on Robert Morris. I also do a lot of work for the Beaver County Times uh, in their sports department. And one of the things that I was doing in the summer was I was at Steelers training camp. And I'm out there, you know, doing a couple stories. And we had done a story on a player named Baron Batch. If you recognize the name, he was a recent draft pick, seventh round running back from Texas Tech. And yeah, Steelers are pretty good at running back situation, but they figured Let's bring this guy in, see what he can do. He might be a guy that we can keep around, and perhaps as time goes on, he could be a good third down back, a special teams guy. So people, he was a really unique guy. He wasn't your typical football player. He was a erudite, very classy guy. And he was also a blogger. He was big on social media. He was this great personality. So naturally, the media fell in love with him. Now, training camp starts... Turns out this guy can play football a little bit, too. There is a drill in every training camp, in every level of football, high school, college, pro, called backs on backers. One running back, one linebacker, and this poor high school kid pretending to be a quarterback. Linebacker rushes the quarterback. He's not wearing any pads. Linebacker's in full pads, running back's in full pads. It's running back's goal to step up and put a solid block on a linebacker. So Baron Bash goes in there and he does his work against Stevenson, Sylvester, and Jason Rose, and yes, James Harrison. He does extremely well. Mike Tomlin's bouncing around on the field going nuts. Dick LeBeau is going nuts. Bruce Arians is going nuts. So I start tweeting. Baron Bash is having a great camp. He just nearly decked James Harrison. I go and write my stories for the week. We had already done a story on Baron Bash, so it wasn't necessary to really do anything significant on the fact that he had done well in this particular drill, but it was mentioned. My phone's on silent for about an hour and a half. I call in my stories, make sure that everything's good to go, and I'm packing up. I'm actually heading over to the cafeteria to get some food before I drive back from the trove. I look at my phone, and there are over 20 email messages from Twitter. They're all new followers. And every single one of them was from Texas Tech because they had heard about Baron Bash and they started following him. So I'm thinking, wow, we don't need anything from the newspaper. But I wonder if Red Raider Sports wants anything on this. Red Raider Sports is the Texas Tech rival site. So I go home and I email Chris Lovell, who's the publisher of Red Raider Sports. And he says, yeah, we'll take anything you can get. So within the next week, I'm at Steelers training camp about three times. I talked to Baron Batch, I talked to Noel B. Moore, I talked to Richard Mendenhall, and I talked to Kirby Wilson, the Steelers running backs coach. Now, Mike Tomlin's not going to say anything about a rookie. In fact, all he said the entire training camp about Baron Batch until you know a few things happened was he's a rookie, and that was it. So couldn't get anything from the head coach, but Kirby Wilson was a good guy to talk to. And suddenly I have a feature-length story that I can use for Texas Tech 
and suddenly, you know, I have more Texas Tech followers because Chris Level's tweeting it, and we're following along, and it just, it was a way as a site publisher to reach out to someone else, help them out in an area where they couldn't get anyone out here. They're not going to cover Steelers training camp. They have 20 somewhat seniors who are probably trying to grab onto NFL jobs every year. They can't have their staff out for NFL training camps, but they actually were able to have someone on the ground and give them a story on a Sunday that was a nice little Sunday feature piece. And it turns out that it works out pretty nice because Texas Tech has actually been recruiting in the Western Pennsylvania area for their latest batch of high school football players. And two players last year went to Texas Tech, and they're back again this year trying to find another crop. So now, Chris and I have an established relationship where if something happens involving one of those former Pennsylvania high school players or a current one, and he has some recruiting news or makes a decision, we now have a relationship so it makes it that much easier to share content and also <coughs> allows us to utilize both of our social media tools and elevate the story so that it gets in front of as many eyeballs as possible. And that's a great transition into, okay, so enough about how we work as a company because we're an online media source. This is what everybody's here for is how do we use it in social media. Um, and pr our primary um, medium for, for, for getting out social media is, is through Twitter. Um, and, and two very, um, very brief examples on this um, is the creating a hashtag from nothing. Um, we did live coverage of one of the top seven on seven events in the country, um, down in Hoover, Alabama, it's called the National Select 7 on 7. And we sent our senior analyst, um, Dallas Jackson, down there, who's also from Pittsburgh, um, and a fellow Robert Morse grad. Um, and he was down there tweeting from the sidelines, and so we decided before he left that we were going to create a hashtag that was Hoover 7 on 7, no spaces, no dashes. That was going to be our hashtag. And so he goes down there, and he's one of the few media members that's down there for the entire event. He gets there before the teams get there. Um, we did an event, we did a, a live chat that was called Live from the Lobby. That literally, he sat in the lobby as the teams were entering, grabbed coaches, talked to them, and would, and would, you know, would take questions and answer questions. Um, so, so he's there and at the event, and we started using Hoover 7 on 7 as our hashtag. We tagged everything that we posted from that event with that Hoover 7 on 7 tag before the weekend was over. Every major news outlet that went in to cover the championship game on Saturday was using our hashtag because they'd seen it on all of our content items. So that wasn't, actually the event had a different hashtag. They were using select seven on seven because that's actually the name of the event. Um, but our hashtag had more traction than theirs did because we'd been tweeting it all weekend and people were following our hashtag. Um, so that just goes to show that, you know, sometimes it's easier to jump in on the conversation if a hashtag already exists. Sometimes it works just to start on your own and just be, you know, beat people over the head with your hashtag. Um, every time you post something, use it, and you never know who's going to catch on with it. Um, the other one, creating an online buzz quickly. Um, last month, uh, Yahoo Sports um, purchased the, uh, the radio network that was formerly known as Sporting News Radio, um, and that's now the Yahoo Sports Radio Network. Um, and the day that that acquisition was announced, um, we had a... Uh, a, a pretty extensive social media plan put into place. Those of us that um, that worked within Yahoo, um, that are Yahoo employees that are on the Rattles network, um, knew in advance that this was going to be announced in the morning. And we were told to wait for the email to officially be announced and then tweet. And as soon as that email was announced, there was going to be a link, but that was the link you're supposed to include in your tweet because that was the, the, the official announcement on the Yahoo, Yahoo Sports front page. So we all had the URL, as soon as we got the email, go for it. So we got up, waited for the email, got the email, and those of us that had Twitter accounts there just started flooding the feed. That email went to all of our site publishers, who then saw the email and saw some of our tweets, and the retweeting started to create, <coughs> no joke, within about 15 minutes of the acquisition being announced and it being live on the radio, my Twitter feed was nothing but holy cow, Yahoo Sports Radio now exists. Um, it was, and I mean, it was literally everywhere. People I didn't know were retweeting it. People, um, you know, I, I picked up a ton of Twitter followers that day just because of that one tweet. Um, and what that shows again is the is the power of having all those different Twitter accounts. You know, you have the one main one that starts it, and then if we're all in on this together and we all start retweeting it, it's amazing how far you can get that message out. 
Um, and what I, yeah, and what I was able to do is, as a site publisher, I was able to latch onto that, and we were given an affiliate list of mm -hmm. where the terrestrial stations are in the, state, in the United States that would be picking up the Yahoo Sports radio feed. A lot of them were former sporting news radio stations, and they just signed on again for a new contract. I had a list of about six to eight stations in Pennsylvania that uh, were in prime locations for me to be able to tell people, not only are you gonna be able to go to PA Preps and get high school sports information, but you're gonna be able to now listen for updates on Yahoo Sports Radio on these stations. And that allowed me to get some followers and a lot just for really to spread to those locations. And I think within a week or so of the announcement of Yahoo Sports Radio, as well as coincidentally the Miami investigation, I had picked up a pretty nice subscriber boost um, that had allowed me to really keep things going heading into the football season. So it, it does translate when you're able to take a topic and join in on the conversation and then maybe redirect it back to something that you're working on and, or that you're doing or that you're involved in, um, you can see tangible benefits as long as what you're providing is you know, something decent as well. And of course, subscriber boost make me as a producer happy. So. <laughs> um, other things, things that we've learned along the way. Um, RSS feeds don't work. That shouldn't be a surprise to any of you um, sitting in this room that if you use your Twitter feed or your Twitter account as strictly an RSS feed and don't have any interaction on it at all, um, your, your Twitter following is not going to be very good, um, nor are people going to find your, your Twitter account very useful. Yeah, sometimes, and sometimes you can use an RSS feed. I still use one, but that can't be it. Mm -hmm. And what I've actually tried to figure out is how to make my RSS feed sound even less robotic than it already does. Because most of the feeds are set up so that it grabs you know, the URL and the headline and maybe a brief description and deposit it, deposits it on your Twitter account. I've actually gotten away from some of the RSS feed stuff, I still use it, but if I post a story that I want out immediately, then I will actually post something conversationally and just include the link and then a couple hashtags that might detail it. So it's, it's, you can use RSS feeds, but they tend to sound more robotic, even if you are an active Twitter user and you're doing other things and you're being conversational and you're interacting with your followers, even if, and that RSS feed jumps in there and that link jumps in there, it, it's like this little robotic glitch that says, you know, yeah. you're not as conversational as you think you are. I, I know that Justin said that numbers don't mean anything, and, and I, in his session, I totally agree with what he was saying there. But if, you, if you're looking for numbers to back this up, we have them. Um, the, we have an official Twitter account for the entire Rivals Network. It's called Rivals.com, all one word. Um, and one year ago, that Twitter account had 1,500 followers, which for a national media entity, not that great. Um, and it was strictly an RSS feed. We took it completely off the RSS. We started um, doing everything by hand because we have an internal emailing system that's actually faster than our RSS feed. So as soon as a good story is posted, everybody on the email list, distribution list gets it. So the person that mans our Twitter account now, he's on that email list. So he's just taking the email, copying and pasting the link, and writing his own tweet and sending it out. In less than one year, we are now up to 8,500 Twitter followers. Um, and we're gaining at about 200 a week, and we're, hope that, and we're hoping that that puts us up over 10,000 before the uh, before full season. That's our goal is to hit 10,000 before full season. Full season. Um, so if you're looking for evidence that we shouldn't be using an RSS feed, that's it. Um, because that's surely the only change that we have made um, in our Twitter account that has caused that many followers. Um, Social interaction is important. That's along the same lines. Um, we get a lot of customer service requests to our Twitter account. Um, you know, why isn't this working? You know, how, when uh, the most common question actually is when are rankings coming out? Um, and before when that was on an RSS feed, people would be asking those questions and nobody's answering. Um, and so by taking it off the RSS feed and putting a body there, um, it may take a while to, to, to find the answer and get, get a reply back, but we've started replying. Um, in fact, there was one example, this was a couple weeks ago, somebody said, if you can explain to me why this team is ranked above this team in the recruiting rankings, you'll get a subscriber. And it took a couple hours to get the question answered, but we got the question answered, and he said true to form, and he's now a subscriber. Um, so, you know, dealing with customer service kind of stuff, it's a, it's a pain. When you don't know all the answers, when, when you're, you know, the person that runs our Twitter feed is 
a writer on the college network. Um, he's one of our national college writers, so he doesn't know the customer service stuff. He doesn't know, but he knows who to ask. Um, so when he starts getting questions, he'll go ask them and get those answered. It's amazing just that back and forth, how that's improved. Um, having a strategy and strong leadership is key. This has really kind of um, helped as we've moved in this last three month period. Um, the next slide I'm gonna get into is, is about how much we have grown in three months, which is pretty pretty outstanding and um, in what we've done. Uh, and part of that is because we have new leadership at the top in Rivals, um, who's a very dynamic and strong leader. And he's managed to capture the essence of everybody and get us all working together as a team. Um, and so when he tweets something, it's, you know, the, the old, when he says jump how high um, kind of thing. I mean, it's not to that extent, but at the same time, we, we respect every time you put something out there. We know when he says there's big news coming, there is big news coming. Um, and so just having somebody to kind of focus that effort and say, we have a big announcement coming on Monday, be ready. Then everybody is ready. And in fact, I get emails saying, where's the announcement? When it, the announcement was, one of the announcements we made was actually like two hours late. And um, because we told everybody to be released at noon and then we had a technical glitch and we weren't able to announce it right on time. And so I was actually getting emails from publishers saying, I thought the announcement was coming at noon. Uh, <laughs> he was one of them. <laughs> um, but it you know, wasn't anything that we could do. It was, it was, we were waiting for servers to clear before it worked. And that's actually our new mobile site. So if you go to mobile.rivals.com, we have an entirely new mobile app, um, mobile experience that's pretty top notch. All runs on HTML5. HTML5, so. Um, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's great for iPhone. Um, and I mean, there's still bugs in it because it's only been out for two weeks. Um, so if you hit a glitch, it's you know we know about it. We're working. Should um, I send that to your Twitter feed? Sure. Twitter yeah, that would be yeah, that would be great. Yeah, I take questions. Um, <laughs> I'm good friends with the tech guy. Yep. Hi Keith. Um, so that's kind of helped us in, in doing that um, and getting those messages out. Just having somebody that's in charge and that we know is in charge um, has definitely changed things dramatically. Um, not everything works. We've and that's okay. We've tried a bunch of different things with our with our national Twitter account. Um, you know, not every hashtag you try to create sticks. Um, you know, Justin is right in the fact that sometimes it's like just throwing stuff at the dartboard. Some things work, some things don't, and you don't always have an explanation for it. Um, you know, we we tried doing trivia questions. We were announcing stories. We weren't getting very many retweets. We weren't getting very many responses. What people kind of like is if you fo if you focus on one particular team, that seems to get a lot of retweets. So it, and sometimes it depends on the day. You know, we'll retweet the same story three or four times, and it'll be the one that we just kind of did because we were like, oh, it's been a couple hours, we should probably put the story back out there again. That's the one that gets all the traction, and you didn't put any thought into it at all, and that's the one that everybody loved. Um, you know, so is there a science to it? To an extent, but not always. Um, college football fans, high school football fans are fickle, and it just kind of depends on what their mood is really when they, when, they see the, when they see the tweet, whether or not something is actually going to stick. It's, it's kind of a unique. And it, goes, and it goes back to what we've tried to figure out as site publishers, and that is what works in Pennsylvania may not work in North Carolina. So uh, again, it's, it's a concept of finding what works for you and for your site or for your company, whatever you end up doing. It's all about finding your audience and playing to that and not trying to hold to any hard and fast theories and rules. Mm -hmm. It may not work for you. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on is, is Friday Night Football, and, and this is kind of an ongoing joke, meets the community of Twitter. Um, I mean, the, uh, the Rivals High 100, um, we put out a, a, a ranking of, 100, of the 100 top high school football teams in the